Hey, it's showtime. Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. Thank you for joining us today. The topic for this episode is compressor failures are how to break and barbecue your compressor without really trying. Sounds like a new cooking show, doesn't it, John? It does, actually. Yeah. yeah. You got something else to say about that? Is that about it? Oh, that's, that's about okay, it. Good. This is the continuation of a series of presentations that has been following the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that went around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. What a novel concept that was. Haven't seen much of that these days. With this Tech Talk entry, we're bringing the supermarket seminar concept directly to you and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process. We are presenting this material on compressors because it helps to complete our discussion on system components. Now keep in mind, there's a wealth of available information within the industry on compressors and compress compressor failures. We, en we encourage you to seek and study this information as we're only scratching the surface of this subject. Right, John? I mean, That's we right. could go on right. and on. Yep, this is, uh, this is maybe even a series of webinars all on its own. I could see that. We're compressing it into one, so. Compressing it into one? Yeah. Compress we generally- Did you catch that? Yeah, I caught that. <laughs> We generally included a brief section on this topic in the old supermarket seminars. And speaking of that, here's a shameless promotion for the next mm -hmm. webinar. On May 20th, we will present what's trending with supermarkets as we boldly go into the future. There's lots of changes in that part of the business. Don't miss this one, as this webinar will mark the conclusion of our series of supermarket seminars with a bit of a grand finale. Hope you'll join us. John, you think anybody will miss us after that? Oh, maybe, but not if their aim's good enough. Well, hopefully their aim's not that good. Here are a few instructions. You've heard some of this before if you've been joining us. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you can simply dial in with your phone. There should be a phone number somewhere on the invitation that you originally received for the webinar. But here it is on a slide in case you don't have it handy. As we move along and you have questions, you could type those questions into the Q&A window we plan to answer some of those live. More often than not, we run out of time to answer all the questions and we will eventually post answers online. However, if you hang on, there's a good bet that we may answer your question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, this is a question that always comes up. We are recording this. Should we run into any broadcasting problems or lose internet? You could go back and listen to the recorded version because we will plod right along just acting like it's everything's normal. And we'll post those out on Facebook Live for your listening pleasure and later on the Sporlin YouTube channel. Sporlin is always here to assist you with your air conditioner and re air conditioner, air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporlin headquarters. That's this number right here, 636-239-1111. This number will provide options to get you to customer service or tech support. You can also dial tech support directly and get a human that will help you with all of your application problems. Mm -hmm. That's this number, 636-392-3906. You can also shoot an email to us, svdtechsupport at parker.com. That's for air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. And we're available 24-7 at www.sporland.com. And just so that you know, I'm this guy on the left. I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Application Team. And over here on the left is my good friend, John Whithouse. This is a bit irrelevant since we're broadcasting a video, uh, but we decided to leave this slide in there anyway. It gives me something That's to right. talk about. John is our Senior Principal Engineer for the Sporland Division. As I've said in the past, he's a published author, consultant, and all around extra smart guy. He's a big deal around here. And we're always glad to have him along. You're supposed to say hi now. Hi now. Phyllis is also in the room. She's our communications director. She tells us what to do and when to do it. Um, things like advancing slides, when to not advance slides and, and as a big help to us. Uh, however, before getting into the meat of the webinar, we thought it'd be kind of a nice idea to take some time and answer a few actual questions from the previous webinar yes. that we recently presented on defrost methods. Keep in mind, this is an actual question, believe it or not. It is. 
Matthew H wrote to us and said, if we eliminated all of the frost, what would happen to our marriages? John, what do you think about that? Well, we're not real sure why that you have, uh, have uh, mistaken either one of us for Dr. Phil, but uh, you know, it could actually warm up the relationship. So that's probably a good thing. Hmm. Here's another one. We did receive a number of interesting questions from somebody who goes by the name Anonymous. I don't know this anonymous character and we didn't have a good way to get back to them. And this is actually a really good question. Uh, does a pump down evaporator take longer to defrost since the latent heat benefit of a saturated evaporator would not be present? John, what do you think about that? Well, it is a very good question. Uh, and yes, it could actually take uh, incrementally longer time to defrost the evaporator. Um, a few minutes maybe. Um, with um, you know, with off time defrost, there's probably no real benefit to pumping down the evaporator. Um, but with electric defrost, it probably is a good idea to pump down the evaporator. Excellent. Oh, here's that anonymous person once again. Now, on this particular question, I think you could probably write a dissertation on the subject. And I got to give them credit. They snuck in a whole raft of questions in this single one. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on cool gas effectiveness versus electric on frozen coffin and reach in and the long term energy impact? John, I'm going to ask you to take this one too. Okay, I can do that. All right, so cool gas and electric defrost uh, are both used in case designs for low temp applications. Uh, electric defrost works pretty well uh, in all the scenarios laid out here. Uh, but you do have to pay for it. You're paying uh, for the electric to those kilowatts for those kilowatts. Absolutely. Um, I would have to say that in low temp uh, cases, cool gas is probably uh, generally more effective on the reach ends uh, as compared to cool gas on uh, the island cases or coffin okay. cases at the low temp at you know these applications. Um, from an energy perspective, more electric assist heat is probably going to be required to finish the job. In other words, get the frost completely melted and down the drain on the coffin or low temp island cases versus the reach in cases. And again, you have to pay for that energy for those kilowatts. All right. We just thought it'd be kind of interesting to go back and address those questions that came to us. Mm -hmm. Now, here are some ways the compressor can indeed fail. Compressors fail for various reasons. We discussed the need for TEVs in an earlier webinar. We must stop liquid from returning to the compressors because that can cause damage. When compressors try to compress liquid, things don't go right for the most part. Promoting oil return is also important. Here are some mechanical ways, flooding and liquid slugging, and then of course, loss of lubrication. So what is flooding or flood back? We'll answer that question shortly. And how about liquid slugging? Uh, same here. We'll eventually answer that question. Motor winding failures. There are shorts, grounds, burnouts. Uh, when the time is right, we're going to talk about what constitutes a short, what constitutes a ground, and what happens with a burnout. You know, you're not the only one that gets hot in the summer. Compressors can overheat literally any time of the year. We'll discuss some ways to prevent this from happening to you. And some of them are listed here that can cause compressors to overheat, ranging from a dirty condenser, an uninsulated suction line, high compression ratios, and that high superheat thing. But why do we need superheat? Superheat is insurance. You can always go back and watch our TV webinar. We'll talk about superheat at length. Also in our What is Refrigeration, part one and two. Superheat guarantees we are sending vapor back to the compressors. Compressors like to compress vapor. Sometimes you'll hear folks in the trade refer to that device as a pump. Pumps move liquid. Compressors compress vapor. That's, That's just a play on words. Consistent liquid refrigerant flood back can damage compressors by washing away the oil that lubricates them. And apparently flood back leaves a very distinct wear pattern on parts like these pistons you see here. This is flood back or flooding. That's small to moderate amounts of liquid refrigerant being introduced to the compressor inlet over long periods of time. That's correct. That's what I consider flooding. That makes, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think people sometimes confuse that with slugging, but we'll get in. We'll, we'll talk about in. slugging. Yeah. There is a difference. Now, with 
adequate amount of humidity in the ambient air and sub freezing surface temperatures on refrigeration components, frost can appear. Does this automatically imply floodback? No. No. So here's, an, here's a situation that you told me about the other day. You know, we've had some people uh, that encounter a compressor that exhibits a frost laden suction line and end bell. Uh, does that mean it's flooding back to the compressor? You know, uh, consider a situation with low temperature equipment running at maybe even as low as minus 25 degree saturated suction temperature and operating with plus 50 degrees of superheat at the compressor. And the compressor can still have plenty of frosty parts on it. That's right. Suction and end bell. But it's not flooding. It's right. got positive superheat. Right. A, a perfect example. You take the minus 25 saturated suction temp, add 50 degrees of superheat to it. You've got plenty of superheat to keep the compressor safe, but you have a suction line, service valve, and end bell. That is why. At about 25 degrees out. Oh, what happens then? <laughs> the stuff gets frosty. Frost and ice all over it. Yeah. However, however, if the crankcase and the discharge line is frosty, <laughs> you may have a problem. Yeah, so you get frosty discharge line, that's definitely a problem. But, but the only surefire way to determine this is to check superheat. You're gonna have yeah. to you're gonna have to monitor temperatures and pressures and then get some reference information out for the refrigerant that's circulating through the system to determine what's going on. If you happen to have a medium temp system and you see, you know, frosty uh in bell that's maybe a little stronger indication that might be a different situation that might be a different situation but ultimately check super eat see what you have coming back to your compressor now let's take a look at the slide reasons for flooding or flood back and we'll use those terms interchangeably on the air side faulty evaporator fan motors belts and fans could have a dirty evaporator coil in our filters could have plugged honeycombs in a display case you know, that fouled evaporator could also imply being excessively frosted up or bunk bunkered with ice. Absolutely. You know, that's going to happen maybe in a refrigeration system. Yeah, that's right. That's that's actually a very common cause of, uh, of actual air side blockage on a refrigeration system. You know, that have this similar result for system performance as if the evaporator was excessively fouled with debris. A dirty evaporator might likely be more of an issue with an air conditioning system. You keep in mind that fins per inch thing on a typical air conditioning unit by, might be what, John, how many uh, fins? Maybe is maybe 14 fins per inch, even maybe even higher on some of the brand new units. That, that's almost acting like a filter in and by itself, right? It is. Whereas on a refrigerated case in the evaporator, what are you looking at there? Uh, uh, two, Wider spacing? Yeah, definitely. Maybe old cases, two fins per inch, newer ones, three, four or five fins per inch, um, not nearly the fin spacing. So it's not nearly as easy to catch uh, small debris and dust and things like that with, yeah. with fin spacing. So okay, and that really changes things with respect to being clogged with dirt. You know, it can get yep. through there, but ice might be more of a problem with the refrigeration side, whereas right. you can clog an air conditioning evaporator up pretty quick if you're not keeping an eye on the filters. Regarding the refrigerant side of things, over here, you've got improper TV bulb installation, incorrectly sized or adjusted expansion valve, poor distribution, a leaking check valve on gas defrost. That's kind of interesting. It I'm is. not sure I would have thought of that. It is. It uh, can happen though. Possible leaking liquid to suction heat exchanger. These last two examples, let's take a look and see how that could happen. Here we go with the evaporator. Here's an expansion valve that's feeding it. You see the expansion valve bulb and equalizer line. And here's a bypass around the thermostatic expansion valve with a check assembly in it to help promote the flow of defrost gas. Defrost gas. Now, if that check valve leaks, what happens? If that check valve leaks, then liquid's going to be able to pass directly from the liquid line into the evaporator without being metered by the TEV. Ah, that's unregulated flow. Unregulated flow. We didn't ask for any of that. We did not. That can cause a problem. I'm not sure I'd have thought of that. That's a good thing to know. You know, a very small amount of leakage and the TEV might actually uh, compensate for it because it's still looking at total superheat at the end, but you get very much flow through there and uh, it's going to cause a problem. Here's another one. A number of things would need to fall into place to cause flooding with this situation. 
We're talking about a liquid suction heat exchanger leaking internally and promoting flood back. If the liquid suction heat exchanger is a manufactured version that you bought from an OEM, it could possibly be the source. Have I got that right, John? Because that could things line up correctly there for that to happen? I think they could. I think they could. I think that's probably a fairly um, uncommonly occurring one, but it certainly can occur. Right. You'd have to check the temperatures here like we're suggesting to see if that's actually happening. Uh, maybe a fabricated version out in the field with where you've got direct contact tubing and you and you kind of braised them together. That might not be as likely to facilitate flood back in that situation. Is that a fair statement? I think well? so, yeah. I think that's a fair statement. Absolutely. But this is interesting. I'm not sure I'd have thought of this. Now, here's a really good depiction of liquid slugging. We talked about liquid slugging just a little earlier. Stack up a good solid column of liquid at the compressor inlet and let it rip. Good bet you're going to break something. Yeah. Right, John? Right. Here we've got an evaporator. We're trying to depict liquid. And then we got a, the start of a column of liquid here in this suction line. And then liquid oil and liquid refrigerant maybe culminating in this transition or this elbow. This is slugging. That's slugging. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's tell good. us about that. Okay. Slugging, uh, by our definition, is a large amount of refrigerant being introduced to the uh, compressor uh, in a very short period of time. We said flooding was a small, you know, smaller, moderate amount of liquid over a long period of time. This is kind of the, the flip side of that situation. Um, flooding. Uh, implies that you're going to have some liquid uh, in there, uh, you know, doing bad things with your oil supply, things like that. Yeah. Slugging uh, implies that you're going to get a bunch of liquid all at once and you're going to essentially hydraulically lock. Ouch. Uh, yeah, hydraulically lock. Oh, so okay, could you say if you're experiencing some consistent flood back, you're going to see some accelerated wear? In the compressor components, likely there's a very like very good likelihood. However, if you have liquid slugging going on, you're likely to see some catastrophic failures of components. Yes. Is that so? Here, those, those are pretty catastrophic, right there. Yeah, we got a liquid slug that can damage compressor parts. Mm -hmm. Attempting to compress liquid can cause major compressor parts to snap in half. Yep. Here are two examples. Here we got a discharge read over here. Part of it is gone. It has come from together, as they mm -hmm. say. That's right. Likewise, this crankshaft is no longer a shaft. It is it's, now shafts. It's shafts. Mm -hmm. Now, talk yeah. about getting a shaft. So, uh, and, uh, you know, another, uh, something else that's a byproduct of this, it probably happens even more often. Yeah. We probably should have a photo of it. Uh, bent connecting rods. Oh, you had to bring that up. Yeah, had to bring that up. Now, if this, if the, if the oil return is a problem, and keep in mind, you could go back and look at our webinar on oil systems and learn more about this. Uh, there's things that can be done to get that oil back to the compressor. Uh, here are some reasons why you might have some lubrication being entrapped out in a system, low load conditions, low refrigerant velocities. If you don't have traps and piping that's correctly designed and if you've got a, a low charge of refrigerant, uh, if the compressor's short cycling, mm -hmm. those are some things that can contribute to a loss of lubrication. However, if we have a loss of lubrication, these are some things that might take place. Uh, oil logging out at the refrigeration case serves no useful purpose. The place where we want the lubricant to exist is in the compressor to right. help keep those moving parts working efficiently. Oil that's out in the system decreases evaporator efficiency and it can't do its intended job of lubricating the compressor. Here are a few examples of some damage resulting from loss of lubrication. You notice there are wear characteristics that aren't normal on some of these parts, right? Yeah, I would have to say the uh, egg-shaped end of the connecting rod is, uh, is a little that, that's, unusual. That's, yeah, a little unusual. I bet you'd have to pay extra to get that on a new piece of equipment. Um, yeah, probably so. Probably so. Now, compressor overheating. Excessive discharge temperatures in compressor overheating can create major issues for supermarkets. Maximum compressor temperatures cannot be easily measured, I guess, unless you got some nice onboard compressor sensors. But here's kind of an interesting way to at least approximate the discharge temperature 
um, or the operating temperature of the compressor. Go out about six inches away from the compressor housing and get some type of sensing device on here where you can check the temperature of the surface of this line. And, and then what do you do? You add 50 to 75 degrees, and that's pretty a wide swing range. So you, this is gonna be approximate. It is, it's gonna be an approximation. But it can give you an idea yep. of how the compressor is operating with respect to, to the temperature. And I think this is a neat technique and it's it got is. some use. It is, I've, uh, I've seen, you know, I've had people to, uh, you know, just state that they just don't believe there could be that much difference, but I've actually personally witnessed it. Uh, I've actually witnessed a very well instrumented compressor uh, where the discharge valve backers were actually running between 50 and 75 degrees above uh, what was measured on the discharge line, right. six degrees, or pardon me, six inches out of the uh, compressor. Yeah. I've actually personally witnessed it. So it yeah. does happen. It does happen. Well, why is this important? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Hey, Dennis, we're on slide 20. Here's an overview of temperature limits with respect to compressors and lubricants. The maximum compressor temperature, I guess, depending on the manufacturer, depending on, on the model, really shouldn't be much higher than about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, at 310 to 330 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to see some accelerated ring and piston wear. And things like mineral oil, because that's still out in the industry being used. There are still some out there. Mineral oil starts to decompose at around 350, and, and that polyester lubricant starts to de decompose and deteriorate. Boy, deteriorate. Say that four times real fast, John. Can you go ahead and do it real time? No, no, uh, don't, we probably don't, don't. want to do that. Also, the compressor sump should remain around 200 degrees or left to have good, reliable operation there. So here's some reasons why compressor overheating is of concern. Now, here's something else that comes into play. You, you ratchet up the temperature, that discharge temperature, and the rate of chemical reactions increase drastically for every 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Look at this chart. Yep, As, it basically doubles for every 10 degrees C or 18 degrees F. Yeah. So as the discharge temperature climbs, so will the rate of chemical reaction. Well, why do we care about that? Uh, rate of rea that chemical reaction rate doubles, but that means lots of bad things can happen with that. It does. It does. Now, so we've got some high superheat, high compre compressor superheat, high discharge temperature resulting from all of that. Here are some things that you can do to alleviate these high discharge temperatures. Mm -hmm. Clean the condenser. That seems pretty straightforward. Definitely. Insulate the stink and suction line. How many times have you gone out on a job and there's no insulation on the suction line? Uh, more than I'd like to count. Now, this lower compression ratio issue gets a little tricky. I'm not sure easily what you do about that, but there are some things. Uh, yes. Okay. That's a, maybe another subject. Yeah. Thermostatic expansion valves. It's, it's unusual to find a new su supermarket that has mechanical valves in it that are all correctly dialed in because that's a lot of dang trouble to go around and commission all those valves. But it's important if that's what you have to make sure that they're controlling the superheat that you're expecting to see. If not, then you're gonna potentially run into trouble. Now, here are some interesting things you can do compressor body cooling fans. I see those deployed on occasion. Yep. And then here's something that some folks may not know exists. We have, we have temperature responsive valves that inject liquid into the, into the compressor at some point that help to keep the discharge temperatures down. Correct. It is a product we call a Y1037. We're gonna talk just a little bit about that in a few slides to come. Now, Here's something with respect to things that I'm not sure I fully understood. A one degree reduction in suction temperature will yield a one degree reduction in discharge temperature. I guess that makes sense. That's by and large true. That's, that's by and large true. So if you can, uh, if you have discharge temperature concerns, see what you can do to reduce your suction temperature because it'll, you'll yield a, a benefit in, in doing that. You'll, you'll, It'll that, help you out help. with system performance. It will, Absolutely. It'll help you get there. Okay. Help you get there. Now here's another way to help you get there. Sporlin has something we call a Y1037 valve. It's a temperature responsive expansion device. 
and for those of you that don't know, over the years, Sporlin has used this type of designation to identify the OEM specials that we've designed and built over the years. This is the 1037th special that we've done. We're up into almost the 1400s today. Now, this is a temperature responsive valve. And at one point in time, I was charged with coming up with a new name for the product. We were gonna call it a TREV at the, at the time. We had a massive outcry from the trades and our customers said, don't mess with the Y1037. We know that. So it's a temperature responsive valve. It was originally designed and applied to alleviate high discharge temperatures caused by using R22 on low temperature systems. This came about during the transition stages with the phase out of CFC refrigerants and R22 was utilized in applications that weren't arguably the best fit for it, low temp, right. which resulted in high discharge temperatures. So with the installation of this valve being fed with liquid from the high side of the system and being injected here into the suction with a with a feedback loop in terms of a sensing device here on the discharge, we were able to help solve that problem. The bulb is attached to the discharge line and opens allowing liquid to flow into the suction to keep discharge temperatures from getting too high. You do need to be a little careful with the selection and the sizing to make sure suction line superheats don't get too low, get to a dangerous level and then risk flooding the compressor. Right. We should point out that the liquid that that injects really is by and large all evaporated inside that suction line. You're not actually introducing, uh, if, if everything is uh, selected and sized correctly, you're not, these are not introducing liquid to the compressor. These no. are introducing liquid to make the compressor Typically. suction gas cooler. Typically. Yeah. There are some versions and there are some OEMs, however, that do take that approach mm -hmm. and, and direct it. But those are specialty applications That's with, with a similar product. Yep. Now, just so that you can see what can happen with some compressor motor failures and from the electrical slot side, you know, the motor winding installation can break down in the presence of these excessively high discharge conditions, which if things really go awry, you know, we might have the presence of acid showing its ugly head mm -hmm. and compressor motor windings can break down. And here's just some examples of some uh, compressor failures that have resulted from various things that can cause damage. This is kind of interesting. interesting yeah, that's, right? uh, that's come from together, I think. I think that would be the result of a liquid slug right you there. You think maybe? Yeah, I might, think have, that's, might have uh, broke the heck off. And, yeah. yeah. And then here's here's you some start, more. You start what? cracking castings in two. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, and then here, this is interesting. There's, there's some damage going on here that might have resulted from some contamination being in the system and then ultimately contributing to things that we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. But compressor motor failures can result from just debris in the system uh, that the oil might pick up and, and, and screens might be clogged, loss of lubrication, uh, start running with failed bearings and a rotor drops into a motor stator. Who would have ever thought that would happen? Metal filings penetrating the motor insulation. I think that's kind of what we saw in that previous I image. I think so, yeah. Uh, and, and shorten out the windings. We're going to talk about shorts. Uh, a failed compressor motor from contamination. Who would have thought that that could take place? Now, shorts, and, and not the kind that you wear in the summertime, John, but That's a right. short. How would you define an electrical short? Uh, a short, in the case of a winding, would be basically short-circuiting part of the winding. So instead of the full electrical path, um, it's a, an internal short in the wire, in the Pardon me, in the winding. Uh, and, and so it's the winding, an internal. Yeah. And the, short circuit. Right. And so compare so the, that with a ground. So the winding cannot do its job anymore because you don't have the full, you don't have the full length of copper there okay. in the winding. And uh, a ground is also a form of a short, but that's where you actually short the winding to the case of the compressor. Uh, so you basically are shorting it to ground. Got it. Got it. So it's like an external short. Uh, in a, you could, in look, you could look at it that way, yeah. But yeah. still ways to, mm -hmm. to foul up the operation of the electric motor that's in the compressor. Absolutely. Debris plays a big part in that. Uh, types of contamination that contribute that range from moisture, acid, sludge, oil breakdown material, and solid particulates. 
And if you don't believe that that can happen, here are actual images of components that we've taken out of return devices that have come to us uh, as being uh, malfunctioning mm -hmm. expansion devices, pressure regulating valves and the like. And the catch-all filter dryer would go a long way to alleviating that problem. Yeah. It's a good idea of some of the nastiness you can find inside the system. It's amazing. There. Now, people oftentimes ask us, well, what conditions are in place that would propagate the need to replace, say, a contaminant control? And here is a list. Uh, we've gone over this before. Uh, but they range from new initial system install. Anytime you open the system for any kind of service, you got an excessive pressure drop. Any indication of moisture in the system, any indication of acid in the system. If you have a major burnout, and you're going through the cleanup process, you know, you go back and you replace these devices through that process. After a successful motor burnout and you've done the cleanup, put a new one in. Right. And here, here is some contaminant removal methods during that first 24 hours, maybe take an oil sample, check for acid if there's acid present. You replace things like suction and liquid cores. You replace oil as you need it. You might do some cleanup with an HH style core and you can go back and look at the webinars that talk about those products. That's going to remove all types of contamination. You know, you could come back then in 24 hours and check for the acid levels again following the burnout. If acid remains, you do the remove the oil filter cores and the secondary filter uh, put new new oil filter in, new HH cores, and you replace the oil as you need to do. A new secondary filter may or may not be needed. Uh, you probably caught most of the solid particulates by that time. Probably in that first 24 hours. You know, once acids removed from the system, uh, you remove cores from the suction line and liquid line, and you could replace them with just a filter. But I think the really key thing to take away from this is to remember if you don't determine what caused the original compressor to fail, the replacement is likely to fail as well. Yes, it will. I mean, whether that failure was caused by single phase current causing motor winding problems or whether it was contamination or, or something else. And, right. I, and I'll tell you what, a good bit of the problems that result in a compressor failure have nothing to do with the compressor. Right. They're, they're external things. They're external things. Oh, almost, I'm not going to say all the time, but a great many of the times that's yep, the case. A lot of the time. Here's another device that's sometimes used to protect the compressor, the crankcase pressure regulating valve or CRO. It's employed to protect the compressor from motor overload during periodic high back pressure situations. It closes on a rise of outlet pressure. The outlet pressure of the valve is the suction pressure that will be introduced to the compressor inlet. If the suction pressure gets too high, the CRO closes to a set value so you don't overload the compressor. Mm -hmm. So when can you overload the compressor, John? Uh, mainly on startup. Okay. Is there any other time that that could happen? Just, just only a startup? Uh, it could occur during or after a hot gas defrost, okay. um, but that's when, you, that's when you need some protection of, of one of these CRO type valves. Okay. All right. Well, the CRO prevents outlet pressure from the valve or inlet of the compressor from rising above a predetermined maximum setting. The proper setting is one that's low enough to protect the compressor from being overloaded and high enough so the compressor capacity and evaporator pull down time are not penalized. You could you would normally adjust it at startup when the pressure in the evaporator is above the desired setting. And some people will use an ammeter as feedback when they're going through this process. Right. Because you're trying to protect the compressor. And so you know from the nameplate, sure. what, what those limits happen to right. be. What the compressor should be drawing. And if, you, if you're getting up to that level or, or worse yet over it, then if you be need careful. To, be careful. Here's a question that oftentimes comes up with those folks that are familiar with crankcase pressure regulators. Keep in mind, a CRO valve would typically not be used on a rack or multiplex system, more often than not a standalone or conventional type system. But here's that thing that comes up. What about the utilization of a thermostatic expansion valve with a maximum operating pressure feature in the thermostatic charge, the MOP, if you will. Uh, the MOP approximates the operating mechanism of a CRO valve. Not exactly, but somewhat. It's generally not a good idea to use both of these on, on the same system. If needed, use a CRO or use a TEV with an MOP, but not both. 
the two valves could interfere with one another and likely extend pull down time. John, do we have any questions that need to be addressed that would make sense for us to bring up? Time bet went by really fast and we're starting to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know what? We do have a couple of questions we probably ought to address. Can you answer them? I think I can probably. Go for it. So uh, our friend Anonymous is back. Again, oh no! Again, him again. Well, you know, well, you don't. Just, we, don't we can't. You talk. notice I said person. Yes, I didn't. I wasn't as sexist as you and say he. I no, might mean, be. You don't know who. It might Sorry, be. I apologize. You should. I you apologize. should. Okay. Okay. Question. So the question is, what is the standard compressor superheat range on a single unit or on a rack? Well, basically, what uh, matters the most, uh, if we look at uh, what the compressor manufacturers publish, is the actual return gas temperature. And they will publish a maximum return gas temperature. Um, you really should not, definitely, you should definitely not go over that return that gas level. temperature, okay. that level. That's that's what you should so say. Basically, you're, you're, you're saying check with the compressor manufacturer. Right. On check with the compressor manufacturer. Uh, I think personally, my opinion is that if you have, uh, you know, 20 degrees or so of superheat into a compressor, uh, you're probably safe. You know, 18, on, 19, 20. Yeah, yeah okay. on, the, on the bottom end. Um, but what, whatever you do, um, the maximum return gas temperature published by the manufacturer do not exceed that. Yeah. What else you got there, John? Anything okay. Else? The other, the other question. Is this another anonymous or? Uh, no, no. This is actually from Nicholas. Nicholas. What does Nicholas say? And uh, the question is: Can flooding lead to slugging, or are they independent of each other? Uh, in general, I can't say uh, that flooding could never lead to slugging, but in general, I think they are mostly independent of one another. They typically have different, they typically have different causes um, uh, within the system, and I think they're, uh, they're kind of two somewhat different phenomena. Yeah. You know, like we've said, uh, flooding is a continuous, little, a little bit of liquid continually. You got, you got a thermostatic expansion valve that's out of adjustment and it's right. running too low a superheat. Right. Slugging uh, is a whole lot of liquid in a really short period of time. Yeah, somebody inadvertently closes the service valve at the compressor suction and then stacks a bunch of liquid up in the suction line, clear back into the evaporator and right. run lesser rip. Something like that. Okay. Flooding, uh, you know, is going to wash out lubricant and cause the kind of problems we saw on some of those slides with part, uh, you know, with part wear. Uh, slugging is going to cause uh, issues, hydraulic lock issues and major failures. Yeah, and, we don't want either one really. Yeah, we but don't we don't want compressor parts all over blowing the place. apart. That's uh, all over that's really not good. Well, the time wow escapes us. Again, letting you know, you can contact us at our headquarters. You can also call tech support directly. We are one of the few companies that has humans that'll answer the phone here in tech support who are trained professionals and will help you solve problems. And I can tell you, we help folks solve problems with stuff that doesn't have anything to do with anything we've made. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we're just trying to help you solve a problem in the system and we're glad to do it. You can shoot us an email, we res we'll respond to that. Likewise, we got Sporlin.com as a resource for you. Uh, we've got Virtual Engineer, which is our uh, product selection program that's available online free of charge with a whole raft of information that's available through these mechanisms. You can go back and review an encore performance of this webinar on Facebook or YouTube, and we're always out there to try to help you. Remember, on May 20th, we're gonna present what's trending with supermarkets as we boldly go into the future. Please join us for this one. You don't wanna miss it. This will conclude our series of supermarket seminars. Be sure and join us because you're sure to miss us when we're gone, if your aim's not good enough, like John says. This concludes our webinar for today. Thanks for being here with us. Hope you enjoyed it. Please join us next time. Thanks, everyone.